grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I start the sermon, let me just say that it was beautiful hearing all those voices. Have you heard them sing like that recently? During the opening hymn, I just shut my mouth and listened to you sing. My point is this. When we gather together as we are today and we support one another, God sent His Holy Spirit to encourage us and to lead us to rejoice in what He's doing in our lives. And that happens here at Holy Cross. Today, right now, we may rejoice because the Lord is at work. And for that, I, I praise His name. Hear from the text these words, but only one thing is needful. The question is, Who's reading you, or what is reading you, and what are you reading? The world is changing much more rapidly than we could ever imagine. From ads in the paper, which are getting less and less, to ads on the internet, which are getting more and more, and as even called now the information highway. This learning, or this reading, goes both ways. A couple weeks ago, I sought to get an accessory to my golf bag. As I get older, it's harder to bend down and get that ball out of the cup. So one of the guys I'm playing with has this thing on the end of the putter that gets the ball out of the cup. So I went online to find one of these things, and I found one, but I didn't want to pay the cost on the internet. So, believe it or not, within 25 hours later, guess what ad shows up on my internet page? The putter and the thing that goes with it. You try to Google something, and pretty soon you're going to have an ad about it, if you're on the internet at all. And the latest thing about Pokemon, I just this is for you, Coleman. I can be very personal now. Uh, Pokemon, have you heard about what's happening with Pokemon? Watch out for it, because someone's going to find you wherever you are. I thought maybe we might try that right now, and I think I'm right here. And let's see if anybody else finds me. Do you realize, Ruth read this in the paper, I think I've got it correct. 80% of the people who were questioned said they'd rather go with their phone somewhere than with someone else. You got that? What do you think is happening to the youngest generation, your kids' age and your grandkids' age and our junior confirmation age? Nobody talks to each other. You ever watch it happen in a restaurant? Five devices. Sometimes only four people, but somebody's got two. We've not learned how to talk to one another or how to have a relationship with someone else. Now you might wonder, what in the world has this got to do with Jesus and Mary and Martha? Don't think for one minute that Jesus didn't read both Mary and Martha. Look again what he says in the text. Mary is sitting there at his feet listening to everything. By the way, sermons are supposed to be teaching more than anything else. I hope you get something out of this sermon, okay? Secondly, Martha was concerned about a lot of things. She was distracted. She was taking care of stuff. She was kind of like the church lady, if you know what I'm talking about. Somebody that makes sure things are done. And that's good. But she wasn't considering the one thing most needful. Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. A lot of people want to complain about Martha. <clears throat> or they want to say that Jesus was really giving it to her. No, I think it was a kind, gentle reminder. Martha, Martha, only one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen the better portion. What can we learn about that from today? I like what Paul Robbie, a seminary professor, said. Pragmatic American culture supposes that nothing can be more impractical, unproductive, or boring than the study of the Bible. I thought about that, and I am concerned about that for myself, for you, for my kids, my grandkids, and the culture around us. If we are not in the Bible, and the Bible is not in us, how will we know the truth that Jesus says sets us free? In my own opinion, I think the world throws at us distractions and misdirections at every turn. <clears throat> if I ask you to find truth today, how would you define it? You don't have to watch the Republican Convention or the Democratic Convention to find out where truth is not. Am I correct? We watched part of the Republican governor's debate uh, 
this past week, and I don't know who's telling the truth. And it's not going to be different regardless of what spectrum you come from. So how do you know what is true? I also wonder if it might be also what we worry about. What do you worry about the most? What seemed to worry Martha? Martha was kind of concerned that somebody else wasn't helping. Oh, by the way, we have that sometimes in church. <clears throat> it's called electing the same people one year after another, after another, after another, after another. Maybe it's time for us to jump in with both feet and recognize the church is about all of us, not just a few of us. What worries you the most? Think about it just for a minute. What worries you the most? And then think about what you can do about it personally. A number of years ago, I read a good book. Well, I've read a number of good books. But this one talked about worry. And did you know that if you're in an airplane, that someone could drop out something from an airplane, and if it hits you on the head, you're going to get killed? The odds are in your favor is not going to happen. A lot of what we worry about will never happen. 95% of what we worry about does never comes true. I know it's the 5% that gets you going. If I could make free throws 90% of the time, I'd have been an NBA player. What worries you the most? And what can you do about it personally? Here's what Jesus says about worry. Oh, by the way, how would you know what he says? Unless you're in the Bible. Do not worry. Who can add an inch to their height by worrying? And can you add a day to your life by worrying? I'm thankful that Although I have my own, I don't worry about it too much. And part of it is I have no control over it. <clears throat> the only control I have right now is take the medicine or don't take the medicine. I've chosen to take the medicine. But that's it. I'm a little concerned about the bone marrow biopsy coming up someday. But even today I'm not worried about that. You know why? It's not taking place today. What's not taking place in your day today? What distracts you the most? Mary was distracted. We used to have a sign in the office when I was a pastor in St. Louis that said this. If the devil can't make you mad, he'll keep you busy. How busy are you? I thought about that on the way down here this morning. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. One day out of seven. One seventh of the time. This morning you'll probably hear more than an hour of one day out of seven. Is God asking too much of us? And what is the investment on that time? Is it a good investment? You have someone on a number of ways where the word of God comes to you, whether it's a preaching of a sermon, the hymns we sing, the words we speak. They're for our good, they're for our welfare. What makes you busy? I think some things haven't changed since I was a younger pastor. It seems to me that young families, and I see a number of them here today, are concerned that their kids will survive in this world. Make it in this world. But what about the life of the world to come? We're going to baptize Macy. Lord willing, on August 7th. Macy has no clue. She's looking at her mom like, what's he talking about? But she will become a member of God's family for sure. And the whole eternal life is hers. Her mother's going to be baptized August 7th. This next three weeks, we have more celebrations in this church than you've had for, what, 10 years? Can I hear an amen? Amen. Thank you. God is blessing us greatly. Because we're focused on what he wants to be accomplished here in this community. Jesus said, do not worry about your life. He says, that, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? I want you to think about this right now. How valuable are you right now? Why would the name they told us we were worth 97 cents? I don't think the value has gone up too much either, by the way. And they were talking about our minerals, all the actual assets of our body. 
How much are you worth? Are you worth so much that Christ would die for you? He gave you life, and he's given you the hope of eternal life. And he's given you life today, this very hour. That's how valuable you are. Because of his love for you, Christ Jesus did the one thing needful. Today we thank God that Jesus Christ did the one thing needful. <clears throat> if you look at the scriptures, you'll find out that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's John chapter 1. Christ took on flesh and blood. And then he allowed his flesh to be crucified, the blood to pour forth, so he could be the reason that we would have forgiveness of sins. He fulfilled everything written in Moses and the prophets. If you want to look up one passage, that he fulfilled. Go back to Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. And it depicts Good Friday. You've heard me say before, was it good for Christ? Overall, yes. He said, for the joy that was set before it, it was good because he accomplished what was necessary for our sins. It is Jesus who tells the story of the Good Samaritan right before our text. I wondered about the inner way. Couldn't we say that Jesus is the Good Samaritan? Did he not die for his enemies? While we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of God, he died for us. You see, Jesus Christ is the one who laid down his life for us. Jesus said he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life for many. Do you know what happens after the story with Mary and Martha? Just a little bit later on in the Gospel of Luke, Lazarus dies. Martha and Mary's brother. Jesus comes. They both say, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And then he brings Lazarus back to life. All of this because of his great love for us. God will do almost anything to get us to see the one thing needful. <clears throat> he will either allow things to take place or cause good to you. St. Paul says God works in all situations for our good. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I can talk about my own faith life experience. There are times when I've been put in a corner where there's no place to turn, and the only place to turn is towards God. He allowed me to be put in that corner. He's going to allow you to be put in that corner. But when you're cornered, He comes alongside you. It could be a health problem. It could be a relationship problem. Whatever it is, God works for our good in all situations. That's his promise. Look into God's word and see what is needful. I shared this with the adult confirmation class and the elders last week, and they said, Pastor, you need to share this with the congregation. Every Tuesday morning, almost every Tuesday morning, there are five or six of us to get together for a Bible study in Herculaneum at Crackerburg. I'm a pastor, but I need to be in the Bible. Other than preparing for church, so there's five or six of us to get together. Last Tuesday I said, <clears throat> why are you here? I just wanted to know. The man to my left, the neighbor said, because I'm not disciplined enough to be in the Bible by myself. So I come here. The man across from him said, Pastor, I was there for about 10 years when at 6 o'clock in the morning we met for Bible study and I loved it. That's why I'm here. The third man, he hasn't been there that often to start with, but now he is. He said this, Bible study is the oasis in the desert. Wow! I want you to think about worship here as an oasis in the desert. I want you to think about being in God's Word as an oasis in the middle of the desert. Where do you go to sit at the feet of Jesus like Mary did? Where do you go when you're worried or distracted as Martha was? Let me indicate there's a number of places to go. First of all, there's personal Bible study. Pick up the portals of prayer. Uh, since it's a small church, I can use names. I think Amanda uses a devotion for mothers. Is that right, Amanda? Good idea, isn't it? For a mother, to use a devotion for mothers. There's a devotion for fathers. There's a devotion for husbands. There are devotions for kids. My devotions. Yesterday, I met with a confirmant, junior confirmants, and I asked them to go back and look over their devotions and what they've been looking at. One kid, his name was Coleman. Uh, went back to July. Is that right, Coleman? Yeah. See, he's awake. That's good. <clears throat> went back to July 9th. 
And there was a story about the most important book. And he wrote down there, it says, make a list of your favorite Bible stories. Jonah and the whale. Isn't that cool? How did he know that story? Did he get it in school? School he went to, yes. Would he get that in public school? No. Would he get it at church? Yes. Keep reading it. It's great. Bible study with others. We have two here right now. On Sunday morning today is a voters meeting. Usually we're studying a book now called I Will. It's a great book. On Tuesday morning is a Bible study. You can come enjoy that. <clears throat> and if not then, <clears throat> if you've got questions, we got answers. So one of my favorite books, someone gave this to me for doing their wedding. It's a quick scripture reference for counseling. And I can go in there and I can find anything that you want me to look up where you might have a problem. That's cool. So if you got something you want to know about, text me, call me, write me, but not at 2 o'clock in the morning, okay? Unless it's an emergency. And then there's a book for counselors. <clears throat> and that book is the Bible. This one's been around the block. It now sits on my shelf <clears throat> because I needed a different one. And you probably all have heard this, but it's worth ending the sermon with this note. What does the Bible stand for? Ready? It's an acrostic. You can write this down, Coleman. I'll give you credit for it, okay? <clears throat> Basic instructions before leaving Earth. You got it? Good. Amen. And now may the peace of God pass all human understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus in the life everlasting.